Welcome to the Sultan Valley Chapter Meeting for September of 2020. Tonight, we will have a presentation from Intel Research Labs on their research in creating a VR display with a wide field of view and a compact form factor. I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. If you do, please consider joining us. We can be reached through our meetup. Our group is an entirely volunteer-run organization. Please consider volunteering if you enjoy tonight's presentation. As a volunteer, you can help plan future events similar to this. Please contact us through a meetup if interested. I will now introduce tonight's speakers. Ronald Ozuma is a principal engineer and research manager in Intel Labs. He is known for being a pioneer in AR and is generally credited with the term augmented reality. Alexey Supakov is a research scientist at Intel Corporation investigating novel computational display approaches and digital holography. He has over 20 years experience in areas of different computer graphics related topics. Joshua Ratcliffe is a research scientist at Intel Corporation with over 10 years experience. His research interests are in the intersection of HCL, graphics and display systems. San Diego Alpero is a research scientist at Intel Labs where he builds prototypes for complex optical experiments while also designing user experiences for future VR, AR, and light field technologies. Please visit our meetup page for more detailed biographies. So now let's start with tonight's presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, in VR, a VR display approach providing a wide field of view and a compact form factor. Presented by Joshua Ratcliffe, myself, Alexei Supikov, and Santiago Alfaro, and we're all as he said, uh, researchers in Intel Lab. So before I begin, I should note that this is a research project, so we won't be discussing Intel's product roadmap in this presentation. So here's an outline of today's talk. Um, I'll start with some high-level discussion of our approach. Then Santiago will discuss problems around prototyping and device fabrication. Alexi will dive into the details of the design space and optical design. And then I'll come back at the end to speak to limitations in future work. So motivation and approach. Virtual reality head-mounted displays have seen increased adoption in recent years with millions of units sold. However, numerous technical challenges have stymied their broader adoption. One set of challenges that interested us were device compactness and field of view. Despite major advances in display technology since the 1980s, today's commercial systems retain much of their bulkiness and it's challenging to achieve both an ultra-wide field of view and a compact form factor at the same time. A major reason for this bulkiness is the large optics and concomitantly long focal lengths required. We will discuss this today and examine our own approach to it. There is a rich body of prior work in this area. For the sake of time, I'll focus on three areas that we found particularly interesting. First are canted display systems. These HMDs tilt the angle of the display relative to the base to provide a 180 degree field of view. In this respect, they succeeded the task, but still remain bulky due to their large optical elements and tend to suffer from peripheral pupil swim distortion, which is a topic that we'll get into later. Next are a class of optics known as pancake optics. These systems uh, obtain impressively compact form factors by folding the optical path. In reality, this folding is usually a process of bouncing light between layers of lenses facilitated by polarization. However, there are issues. It can be difficult to achieve an ultra wide field of view and a compact design at the same time. Furthermore, there can be substantial headaches with transmission efficiency, ghosting, and cost. Michael Abrash spoke at a recent Oculus Connect about this, which I'd recommend anyone interested to watch. Finally, we have near-eye lens array-based displays. Rather than using a large monolithic element, in this case, the optical system is an array of lenslets. Lemon and Lukey demonstrated light field output in a near-eye lens array system. This presented the user with accommodation cues and retinal blur, two features which had visual comfort and realism. However, this came with a fairly extreme loss of spatial resolution. Furthermore, an ultra wide field of view wasn't demonstrated and could be challenging with the homogeneous arrays that were used. A picture of one of these prototypes is shown in the lower right. Note how exceptionally thin this display system is. We were very impressed with this aspect of their approach and were inspired to devise an approach of our own for near eye lens array displays that achieves 180 degree field of view in a compact form factor. Furthermore, we seek a more moderated spatial resolution trade-off by specifically not supporting retinal light field output. Okay, so how would this work? Well, in a conventional VR HMD, a large lens is placed in front of a display at a distance slightly less than the focal length. 
This creates a virtual image, usually one to three meters away. A wide field of view requires a larger lens. Unfortunately, for performance reasons, larger lenses require longer focal lengths. Thus, VR headsets derive much of the bulk from the empty space between the optics and the display. It turns out that lens arrays may be of some help here. By scaling the lenses down and using an array of them, the focal lengths remain small. Each lens maps to its own region on the display known as an elemental image. In turn, each of these elemental images contain a subset of the original image, shown as a rainbow on the far left. Note that there is some overlap between image regions. This is a necessity for creating what's known as an eye box, or a region in which the eye can move relative to the display and still see a coherent image. This has implications for optical and geometric prototype design, which we'll discuss the mathematics of in later detail later. Finally, when all regions of the display are seen through their respective lenses, a comparable image is formed in the eye. So in our approach, we combine a curved heterogeneous lens array with a curved display for each eye, offering a wide stereo field of view. A cylindrically shaped array simplifies design complexity by reducing the number of unique optical elements. We create a single column of lenses and then replicate this column of lenses along a cylinder. In fact, due to the column symmetry, only a half column of lenses actually required custom design. Nevertheless, even this presented us with a challenge. So as for contributions, we claim four areas that we hope to provide the research community with some insight. First, we provide a design space analysis of curved lens arrays. Second, we created an optical design that achieved sufficient spot size and pupil spin performance, which was a non-trivial task. Third, we made the design a reality and demonstrated it with real-time and high-resolution implementations. And then finally, we provide some assessment of what we built. So you're probably wondering, did it work? Well, this video shows what the user actually sees as the eye moves into the eye box. Forgive the frame rate here over, over Zoom. We shot this using a wide angle camera with an aperture set similar to the human eye. You can see that as we enter the eye box, the image fuses nicely. So how do we render the underlying image? Well, we start with an input image of a cylindrical panorama for each eye. We then create a lookup table to map this panorama into elemental images on the curved display. This is based on our optics ray tracing data so that the resultant integral image compensates for optical distortions. For real-time implementations, we use the Google Daydream API to access low persistence display mode and then head orientation data. These images are rendered at 60 frames a second on a Galaxy S9 phone. The photos on the bottom show an observed scene and the integral image that's used to create it. Next, Santiago will discuss uh, prototype fabrication. Okay, so hello. Um, so for this um, project, we developed two prototypes. And uh, as you can see here, one was a uh, static prototype and the second one was a dynamics pr prototype. The static prototype was, use, was using a film uh, and the dynamic was using a couple of cell phone um, screens. And we'll get into why we got why, why we went both ways. Uh, each, each prototype has its own advantages. So in general, first we have to design the whole thing. So the first thing we need to do is there's constraints around the lenses that we, that we need. And there's also constraints around making something for the human uh, face. So one of, one of the most critical things that we needed to look into was the interpupillary distance, which is the distance between your pupils. This is gonna be a device that is gonna be so close to your face that you need to match each individual's um, IPD. And in addition to that, there, there's things, of course, like head size, nose size. We're gonna have to do, make, I, would, I was gonna have to make something that was gonna be uh, dynamic enough that everybody would be able to use it. And then inside, and then things that I couldn't uh, move, I couldn't, that I had to work with was things like the screen size. We were gonna use a cell phone screen, uh, the focal length that the, that the manufactured lenses were gonna deal with. Uh, so all of these things were gonna, were gonna have to be um, taken into account for our final designs. So on to manufacturing the lenses. So a traditional way of manufacturing lenses is injection molding, but for a research project where you only need one or two lenses, that doesn't make, that, that doesn't make economic sense. Um, molds are too expensive and they take too long. So we went with rapid prototyping. And 
with rapid prototyping, there's always there's always some caveats. Um, you can do, so we tried we tried three D printing in a clear plastic. Uh, we ended up going with a CNC machine that would uh, diamond cut the lenses directly on acrylic. Now the problem with this, as you can see in the bottom image, is that even if in the computer when we design the lenses, the the joint between two lenses is going to be perfectly infinitesimally small, but in the real world, it depends on the size of the diamond and the size of the bit that's cutting it. And you will see later, this contributes to most of the artifacts that you see in the final images. So once I have, once I have the basic design and I have back the lenses that we manufactured, here's another problem that happens between the real world and the and the computer simulation is that once you have the manufactured lenses and the manufactured parts none of that is going to match exactly what you had in simulation so the focal length is not going to be exactly the same the 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 alignment of the lenses is not going to be perfect as we as we wanted in the simulation so my device and my prototype needed to have every single knob necessary to be able to locate the lens at the right location to the screen and the and both of these inside the rig both of these in front of your ipd and everything had to change and had to and had to do the, and had to be adjusted this is what contributes to the large size of the prototype that you see here but as i get to know what the the different qualities of the manufactured parts then everything starts to go back down and become more compact which is one of our objectives So the other thing that, that was a problem with the static display, because we were using a printed film, uh, is that I needed a backlight and we couldn't get a curved backlight. So um, there were two approaches that I used for this. One was taking a clear acrylic cylinder and cutting it and etching it on the laser cutter so that I could use a, an, uh, an LED array so that I could light it from the side and have the light propagate inside the, inside the acrylic and come out through the etch. This was a good approach, but it was very hard to get an even illumination all across the backlight. So then the other thing I did was we used an electroluminescent panel, which is easy. You can just hook it up to your power source and you can cut it whenever, whatever shape you want. And that is a, from the get go, it's a very even light, but it's not very bright. Uh, so in the end for our final prototype, we went with the electroluminescent panel uh, because we, I can I can live with the low light and be and be smart about what kind of imagery I was going to show in there. Okay. So okay. So then, here what you can see here is the final the static prototypes. In the, in the top you see the static prototype with the cables for the electroluminescent panel, and in the bottom you see what you see through the device taken with a with a DSLR. So here's the, this is the static this is the film that we printed the reason this is the main reason we used the static is that we can, we were able to use a 2032 ppi film which is a crazy resolution but it's good for us to show the future of how these displays would behave if we had that sort of resolution and it's also good for us to actually be very careful and knowing exactly where things are not matching with each other um, but as you can see it's a very very nice uh, image that you get that you get from from a printed film like this. So here, here we, were, we wanted to address another thing is that this is the compactness. So we're offering 180 degree field of view. So in order to compare, we, we took the, the, the device that, had, had, that was offering 180 degrees on the market and we decided to go with the Pimax 5K and we wanted to compare the volume. So in order to make a fair comparison, I took the Pimax and I stripped it out of all of its outer casing, all of its uh, bells and whistles, and I just stripped it down to basically the screen and the lens, only the optical elements. I did the same with my device, and then doing a, after, after modeling in CAD and having my model in CAD and comparing the volume, it turns out that our device actually gives us around a 50% gain in, in size. So now onto the dynamic prototype. And as I mentioned, we had to use a cell phone screen. And the reason we had to use a cell phone screen is because we know that they had, that they had um, the, uh, flexible OLED screens in there. Now, the only problem is how to get the screen out of there. Like we can take the screen, but the screen is still attached to the glass. Uh, getting the screen out 
to detach from the glass and not damage the screen was a very complicated uh, procedure. With original phone, with earlier phones, I could do it myself with dry eyes. Uh, but then with phones like the Galaxy S9, um, we actually had to go to a third party and go to a, to a very specific uh, machines that would take that would probably use liquid nitrogen. Uh, to be able to do this. So we got them back and we have in our hands what would be a 570 PPI screen that we could bend to our will. So here it is, the screen. Uh, this is one of the first test rigs. Uh, and you can see how the screen is being held in the curve at the right distance from the lens. What you can also see here is the other effect of using the cell phone screen is that there is no other way to drive it or to power it except with the cell phone itself. So from here on, we realized that any prototype that we, what that we designed or any test rig that we designed was going to have to take into account that the cell phone had to be attached to the screen. So as, as you can see, the final dynamic prototype, you can see on the left, this is the prototype that you can actually pick up and put on your face. But as you can see, the cell phone is hanging in, uh, behind it. Of course, this is unnecessarily big. Once we had our own screens, if we were to make this ourselves, then we wouldn't have to deal with a cell phone like that. But on the right, you see the actual benefit of having the dynamic screen. The resolution is a little less than the static, the, than the static device, but we actually are able to have animated imagery in there. And we were able to also use the... Uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes to be able to create a, a more immersive VR experience where the, where the device responds to your head movement. And now let me introduce uh, Lexi with Design Space and Optics. <laughs> Hello, I'd like to give more insight into thin VR configuration and optics. Fascinated by compactness of near eye light field display by Landman and Lutke, we wanted to use the same approach to emulate regular stereo HMD. It requires to solve several problems. Maximize possible resolution, make HMD work at large FOVs, and make it easy to fabricate and calibrate. To be useful, the system had to be on par with then modern commodity HMDs. So it should have comfortable eye box, accommodating uh, eyeball rotations. It should have anatomical but efficient eye relief that was about 22 millimeters, spatial resolution of nine pixels per degree, assuming 810 PPI displays. The device should be thin, so display lens spacing is limited to 10 to maybe 11 millimeters. Those parameters gives a starting point in design space exploration. To facilitate easy fabrication and calibration, we preferred single lens array rather than double lens array. To address large FOV, we opted for vertically heterogeneous lens array and curved it horizontally together with the display surface. The simplest curve geometry, that I'm, I'm still on, yes. Uh, the simplest curve geometry is cylindrical centered at eyeball center. It also minimizes the number of different lenslets we need to design. Regular VR displays use flat geometry, so they use flat display and they assume flat virtual surface far behind the lens. Virtual surface in our system is cylindrical and also concentric with the eyeball. We found that under such assumption, the eye box and resolution depend on just two parameters, angular width of lens lets, representing lens pitch, and nominal focal length, which also gives an upper boundary of the device thickness. Next slide, please. I'll talk about some key ideas behind the characterization. In vertical direction, because it's cylinder, our system behaves similar to near eye light for display by Landman Lupke, and we can use their math to get eye box, to get spatial resolution, and all other parameters. So let me step back a little bit to explain the eye box and resolution. So conceptually, it's each lens let is a hole in space. So that, through that hole, we see a portion of magnified elemental image far behind the lens. We don't show that magnified image here on the slide for the sake of space. When I moves different portions of this magnified version of elemental image become visible. So it's pretty much like looking at the far but large billboard through the small hole in the fence. The elemental image shared the same pixel colors, 
where their magnified versions overlap, and that creates one continuous 2D image. We call it image fusion, and it shouldn't be confused with the stereo fusion. So we are looking through this hole at this uh, billboard, but if our eye moves uh, too far up and down or left, right, we will start seeing neighboring elemental image, neighboring billboard. So that restricts the range of lateral eye motion. This region for the given eye distance, I relief is called eye box. Actually, its size changes when the eye moves forward or backward, sweeping a 3D volume. This 3D volume is called viewing zone. And in real life, the shape of this viewing zone also depends on distortion. So it could be curved and not necessarily be a, um, uh, be a uh, segment of the pyramid. The resolution is defined by the uh, total number of pixels visible through all lenses at a given eye position. Next slide, please. The horizontal dimension is curved, so how we derive eye box and resolution. So we started with piecewise linear approximation, which is optically feasible but requires unrealistic faceted display. Then we modified to work on curved display surfaces. We take thin lenses of nominal focal length f placed on cylindrical surface. We assume that the elemental images are flat segments of the cylinder and their corresponding virtual images are also flat segments of the virtual cylinder. Such simplified system enables very easy analysis. The viewing zone for each pair of lens and elemental image is easy to compute and then rotating this viewing zone continuously gives us a conservative estimate of horizontal eye box. The resolution is again number of pixels visible through all lenses. Then we curve the elemental images, keeping them on the same cylinder. And we curve their virtual images to conform to the virtual cylinder surface, which does not change from the piecewise linear case. The eye box stays the same, the resolution needs to be corrected to account for uniform pixel pitch on this virtual cylinder. Next slide, please. After putting the tool together and doing some algebra, we observe the following. Spatial resolution increases with the nominal focal length, but makes system bulkier or reduces the eye box. Making lenses too large puts us at risk of poor optical performance. Next slide, please. The eye box gets larger when this billboard, virtual, uh, the virtual image of elemental image gets larger. This happens when focal lengths become small, become smaller, magnifying the elemental image more, or when the elemental image itself becomes bigger. The angular lens pitch in the horizontal direction defines maximum horizontal elemental image size. So elemental image can't increase independently from the angular lens pitch. Next slide, please. By choosing cylindrical geometry, we made our life easier in terms of characterization, but there are still substantial issues. First, since vertical direction is not curved, we cannot use this trick using very nice lenses. We need to do something to address large vertical FOB. So, because it requires good off-axis performance from the lenses. Our attempts to use the same lens in vertical direction failed miserably. You can see the results. They are kind of rotated horizontally on the left side of this slide. So we decided to design heterogeneous lens array. The second problem, which you could see on the video, is a view-dependent distortion called pupil swing. This aberration is present in all HMDs and human eye tends to forgive it. But in case of lens arrays, lenses are smaller, smaller and we need to bring uh, all these images in fusion. The uh, pupil swim can actually break the fusion if left unattended. Next slide, please. So now we know where lenses should be, what they must do. They have to image screen cylinder to the virtual cylinder within our ideal viewing zone. So it must be trivial. 
to set up a lens design tool and get a solution. To our surprise, standard optical design tools aren't suited well for our problem. In addition, if we use such tools, it takes about two weeks to run optimization every time configuration changes. Aiming at faster design iterations, we decided to make our own lens array design and simulation tool. It is based on very fast and scalable ray tracing library made here at Twin Telescope Embry. Then armed with real-time ray tracing, we could finally see what a person would see looking through the optics. So we could, we could model and simulate not only a single lens, but the entire lens array. We used very simple eye model. It's just a camera with flat sensor and thin lens having four to eight millimeter aperture. Importantly though, we were able to observe how image changes when optics is modified by manual cranking of polynomial coefficients. Or we could visually track the optimization progress and abort it very early if we didn't like what we see. It is worth to note that our software is not intended to replace professional optic design tools because it was made for only one purpose, visually assisted interactive design of heterogeneous lens arrays for VR. And every word in this phrase is important. Next slide, please. The design problem itself is cast as finding a lens performing ideal imaging of display points as virtual image points using geometry-based code function. It's additionally constrained to make lens uh, array feasible to construct. So lenses shouldn't be very thick or very thin on the boundaries, or they shouldn't overhang like that. The lenslet is defined by two preform surfaces based on championship polynomials. To make ray tracing fast, we protesolate the surfaces using fine regular grid and X and Y. The grid is fixed throughout the entire uh, runtime. The BVH acceleration structure for ray tracing is, is built just once and then refitted every time polynomial coefficients change. That way, we can afford very fine tessellation, hence very good precision, maintaining real-time ray tracing performance. Next slide, please. Again, we lose a lot of important functionality of standard lens design tools, but we are able to try a design in a matter of minutes to hours instead of weeks. For actual fabrication, we selected a geometry with repeating column of five lenslets. That required us to design only three different lenslets. For each lens, we started with a thick lens model of a given focal length, we focused our virtual eye at virtual image distance. And then using real-time ray tracing, we visually found good conic coefficients. Then interactive optimization fine tunes the lens using polynomial coefficients. Next slide, please. When we got this newly designed heterogeneous lens arrays, we immediately saw improved image quality and fusion, as you can see on this slide. Next slide, please. The fabricated lens array behaves similar to simulation. Next slide, please. We imported uh, lenslet geometry into ZMAX for MTF measurement, and it showed noticeable improvement of optical performance of heterogeneous lens array. Next slide, please. The static prototype that uses 80 pixels per millimeter light while printed films showed us that image quality improves with underlying display pixel density. This is an image captured from it using wide angle lens. We were so happy with the results that we wanted to show both static and dynamic prototypes live at uh, emerging technology at SIGGRAPH this year. The demo was accepted, but because SIGGRAPH was virtual, there were only videos and slides instead of the live demo. Next slide, please. We, we evaluated visual quality of assembled and calibrated physical prototypes. Although pretty good, the fabricated devices exhibit visible artifacts along lens boundaries and some residual pupil swing. 
There are multiple reasons to it. First, rapid prototyping methods trade low cost and short lead time for some precision. So there is a visible error in lens geometry. Second, lens boundaries were optimized for mechanical visibility, but we never thought we have to do something for optical performance. And the third, the lens array is not AR coded, so there is a stray light. Nevertheless, the resolution numbers for the static prototype, uh, for the static pre, uh, prototype print version are pretty good. The resolution of dynamic version with flexible OLED screen is also on the ballpark of what we wanted to achieve. We got six PPD here instead of nine because we used lower PPI display than the original plan. Next slide, please. I want to remind that like any near eye lights of display, we trade some part of display pixels for the eyeballs. We wanted to see how this uh, 3D viewing zone volume looks like and how it compares with our uh, conservative cylindrical estimate. And having ability to dump all the ray, we estimated the slice of pyramid sitting inside the actual curved viewing zone of each lens. Then we took an intersection of all zones and it gave us real geometry of the eye box. And as you can see, it has nothing to do with the box at all. Even the cross, cross section of it is not a, uh, is not a rectangle. Uh, next slide, please. Moving the camera on translation stage, we were able to verify that real system has the eye box at intended pupil location. And finally, let's look at FOV numbers. Our final design provides about 130 degree horizontal FOV per eye with a stereo overlap, which is limited by presence of the nose on a typical human face and rectangular display shape. The vertical FOV is about 81 degrees. Thank you for your attention. Now I'm handing it over to Josh again. Thanks, Alexi. So yeah, I'll go ahead and speak here to limitations and future work. So what are the limitations of our work and how might we address them? Well, first, you probably noticed we couldn't find flexible OLEDs with the driver board. So this led to prototypes that were frustratingly bulkier than necessary. Also, as with many HMDs, the underlying aspect ratio is suboptimal. Second, our eye box is a little smaller than traditional VR displays, so mechanical IPD adjustment was crucial. Third, with the curved shape and form-fitting dimensions, the design doesn't accommodate eyeglasses very well. One solution may be the use of curved Alvarez lens inserts. Alvarez lenses are lenses whose elements can slide along each other to change the focal length. Perhaps more important is to note that the resolution in our approach is still substantially lower than traditional designs, by about 65% in this particular example. Eye tracking could improve this. If we were to redesign the optics, pair it with an eye tracking system, shrink the eye box down, and then try to trade back in favor of resolution. Finally, a cylindrical design was chosen for its prototyping simplicity, not for industrial design purposes. A fully ergonomic design would require custom designing numerous lenslets, but we think this would be a worthwhile task to, to achieve further gains in device compactness. So to conclude, we believe this is the first work to demonstrate and analyze the promise of using curved heterogeneous micro lens arrays in VR. We've demonstrated a 180 degree field of view, a compact form factor, optical performance that's acceptable both in terms of off axis imaging and pupil swim. And we also provided a design space analysis. We hope this work stimulates new approaches and accelerates the day when VR becomes ubiquitous. For more details, check out our paper from IEEE VR. Thank you. Okay.
I think we have time to have some questions. We have time for some questions. So if uh, anyone has questions, can you please uh, type through your questions in the chat and I will then read them. Well, there's one question here that said the, asked if the slides will be shared somewhere. Um, I think you, you're recording the video, right? And, and putting it on yeah. YouTube? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, so I think we're sharing the materials that way. Okay. So are there any more questions? And and if you Google search on Thin VR, you can find uh, the the paper and and there's also other recorded videos such as the presentation that Josh gave at IEEE VR. So there's already a fair amount of materials already out there. Someone wrote, um, "How does this compare with F uh, FBs? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Facebooks, maybe." Yeah, I think he's referring to a recent research paper actually from SIGGRAPH from Facebook. Right. Um, so. Their implementation, they have done a uh, holographic implementation of a pancake optical system. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in order to achieve basically the thinnest possible prototype they could make. Um, it's a very interesting approach. Of course, we talked a little bit about pancake optics at the beginning of the presentation. So with an implementation like that, you're buying a bit of the problems with both uh, pancake optics and with holograms. Um, but overall, I'd say it's a really interesting approach. For them though, they're focused on the thinness. Uh, but not necessarily the field of view. For us, we wanted to achieve that full 180 degree field of view and then drive thinness with uh, the use of a lens array. Right, and I would say there's 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 different pros and cons. Obviously, the Andrew Maimoni's work and and well, I think I think it was Maimoni and Wang, you know, work uh, at SIGGRAPH is, is very very impressive. Um, you have different trade offs. So, for example, in theirs, they don't have the spatial resolution trade off that you do with when when you're doing lens lits. On the other hand, when you use lenslets like we do, you, you can actually use a traditional display, like an OLED display, which people have spent billions of dollars to make really nice, high quality images on there. And in comparison, when you're trying to illuminate something with lasers and, and go through holog HOEs, holographic optical elements, you different, usually have compromises on the image quality. So it's, it's different uh, pros and cons. Uh, I think we need to pursue, as a field, I think we need to pursue novel types of approaches like ours and what Facebook has been doing to try to get much more compact and wide field of view virtual reality displays. It's not gonna happen unless people try different types of configurations like this. Okay, someone also asked, uh, would the lenses have to be adjusted for each user? No, we uh, actually designed our lens array in a way that as far as your eye, in this viewing zone that we showed in the end uh, of my part, um, any eye could see fused image. That was the uh, key point of the design. You would have so to adjust IPD, per, yes. But, yes. but not the lens per se. Yeah, you'd need to bring both eyes in those viewing zones. And, and also, as Josh pointed out the limitations, this does not perform prescription correction. And it's too compact to actually put your own glasses underneath. So that that is a, a step for future work. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, uh, what type of test pattern would you use to tell user if in the optical position of their eyes? Uh, so I think um, I'm not sure if you, does that make does that make sense or maybe Carlton. Um, I would say any high contrast, uh, kind of maybe a uh, pattern with continuous lines through the entire FOV would be sufficient. Yes, but, the, but then also in the test that we've done it and when we put it on people, uh, what we do is we measure the distance between the pupil and we decided in such a way that the eye box is big enough that once you put it on, you're pretty much inside the eye box and then and then you'll see a, a coherent image. If the, if the image is, is not coherent, you would immediately notice. So gen yeah. Yeah, generally speaking, if, if your IPD is matching correctly in the horizontal, you'll probably be where you need to be in the eye box. Um, vertical might require some extra patterns though, just to be sure that you're centered. So when you look up and down that you're making the best use of the eye box and you're not too far down with the top or the bottom in the central position. Okay, there's also a question that says, um, Regarding resolution and FOV at the periphery, lower resolution is acceptable. Can you take advantage of this to increase the resolution closer to the center of projection to yet get wider field of view? How does this affect the shape of the display and lenslets? 
Well, the eyes would still rotate, right? Um, so you will have to maintain good resolution through the supporting eye rotation. We could benefit from foveated rendering and we probably would do some additional corrections, but it requires so late, low latency system that it pretty much requires redoing the entire stack, starting from camera, uh, USB interfaces or whatever camera interfaces you have, rewriting all the drivers, changing operating systems. So pretty much you have to come up with the entire platform to really support eye tracking really well. Yes, but um, that, that's the rendering workload. I, I, mean, I think the, the question was also about foveated displays itself, right? Could we actually change the resolution depending upon what I was looking? Um, interesting idea that what we currently have is, is not a foveated display. Is there, are there any more questions? There was a comment about our determination to separate out the screen. Yes, thank you. We were very determined. <laughs> <laughs> what is what we, we needed that screen. <laughs> yeah, the, the Samsung doesn't make it uh, easy to to liberate this, the the screen from the glass. And, and it gets harder as you go in the generations. Initially, we were doing the, the, the Galaxy S6. The S6. And we moved up to the S9, and it was way harder. Yeah. So you can't buy just the screen. There's no way to buy just the screen itself without buying the you, whole phone. You can buy just the screen, but it will always come with the glass attached. And that's oh, the problem. Like they, they, they don't conceive of a reason why you would want the screen without glass. Oh, I understand. OK. Yeah. Does, how long does the, someone ask, how long did the prototype take to build? Oh, gee, it would be hard to give an exact estimate for that because it was such an iterative process. I mean, we were going back and forth with Lynch Designs for a long time on this. Um, yeah. I mean, the project has been what? Year? Yeah, yeah the pro no, it's, it's, it's been, it's, yeah, it's been a while. I, I don't know how to really define that because as Josh said, it, it's, it's been many iterations. But so what I, I, I think, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I just, uh, I'm very proud of the team for their determination and staying with it despite the, the, the pro and, and saying that we had to achieve certain milestones such as actually being able to see uh, the display in, in a sufficient eye box and having pupil swim distortion under sufficient control that the uh, that you the, that you actually got image fusion. I mean, th those we we kept going and going and going until actually achieving that. So I would say if you know what you want to build, um, you can do it quickly if you have a team of talented people. Thank you. Uh, someone asks, are there any future plans to create a better design or manufacture it? Oh, well, we're not talking about, you know, specific future plans or what Intel's uh, thing. We, we are talking about the, the research project that we've done up to this point. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, uh, do you, did you ever consider hexagonal lenslets? I mean, it was something I think we briefly talked about, but we didn't, we didn't seriously pursue that. Um, anything to add, Alexi? Um, I think we wanted to solve um, the regular grid uh, type of arrangements first. And once, you, once we know how to do that, we could do hexag hexagonal, although I don't see a lot of benefits from that. Right. I mean, now you're dealing with six uh, lenslet boundaries rather than four. Right. Correct. So someone asked, uh, what material are the lenses made out of? Uh, these are made out of PMMA. So we, we, the, the prototypes that you see here, they were machined, I think, on a five-axis CNC mill uh, directly in PMMA. Yep. So it's just one material, one refractive index, okay. so to speak. So, so uh, Philip, was out of plastic then? That's correct. Yeah, that, that's, okay. a, that's a type of plastic. Okay. Someone asked, could triangular lenses be good? Well, I don't know. I have to think about that. I mean, you've got to think about the the underlying usage of the displays. You break it up into into elemental images. But I'm not sure whether it would be very efficient or not. I haven't even thought about it, honestly. I, yeah, I, I think those questions of hexagonal or triangular, uh, it, uh, as far as the fabrication goes, it don't, like I don't think it would matter to me 
uh, but it's more about like having to deal with a lookup table that that has hexagonal as a base instead of like a straight up grid and stuff like that. And also, how do you define the viewing zone for this triangular uh, triangular shaped lens? It, it would have a lot of narrow regions, right? The, right. Uh, the one uh, good thing about having uh, the rectangular lenses, square lenses or rectangular, you have the, uh, the, the ideal viewing zone is a slice of a pyramid expanding when the eye moves away from the lens. You're losing this property and your viewing zone is actually intersection of all those viewing zones. So I don't think that triangular in particular is a very good idea. Very so nice ask, uh, would a larger screen or display be better? Is there an optimal size? I would actually say a higher resolution display. Um, actually, if you look at the pictures of our prototype, the displays were honestly too large. We didn't need uh, all the, the size that they had. We just needed more pixels on the displays. So smaller, honestly, for our purposes, at least for this particular prototype. But, but it's a large design space. Maybe you come up with something different. Yeah, I suppose you can get some a larger field of view, but then it makes the manufacturing problem harder, right? I mean, if the display is too large and things you know, get, get too close, I mean, you know, there has to be room for the nose, et cetera. How will, oh. so Oh, that's how were you able to integrate this hardware with Unity along? Uh, so how were you able to integrate this hardware with Unity along with the lens distortions? Oh, that was uh, that was relatively straightforward. Uh, we were uh, we were able because we can ray trace through the lenses. We can build lookup tables, and this and then we render cylindrical panoramas. And we can map those cylindrical panoramas with the lookup tables as just indirect uh, texture source. That's it. Okay, uh, so uh, another question is, uh, what would you want to lens let boundaries more? Would, would you want to lens let boundaries more mismatch between the eyes so the eye could might uh, select the lens, the less distorted image or would fusion be a problem? Hmm. I can't picture that question. Not sure I understood I, the question, sorry. I, I, I think I, I, if I properly understand the question is you have those lens boundary, right? Is it important where the lens boundary is located with respect to uh, kind of the central viewing direction of one of the eyes? So if I look straight into the lens boundary, it may, might produce worse image than uh, I uh, when in the case where I looks through ah, the lens. Yeah. Okay. I think it's something like that. Cur currently, the answer is yes because of artifacts. Um, if everything was perfect, then the answer would be no. I think. Yeah, because lenses are closed, and if we assume that lens boundaries are very very thin, they're just defocused. Your eye is focused nearer or more away on the virtual surface. Phone screens are made for looking at one to two feet away, not optical, not optical for one inch away, right? Well, first I'd point out that phone screens are pretty much the basis of all the modern VR headsets that we have. I mean, it's, it's really a question of being able to focus on the pixels themselves with your optics and are the density of pixels on the display high enough? And in that sense, yeah, iPhone screens are suboptimal because they, they don't really need the sort of resolution that we would like to have in virtual reality. That's been making some improvements, but honestly, it could go a lot further. I guess uh, it's getting close to the hour, so if um, there's no, let's wait for a minute and see if we get any more questions. Any more questions, and then we'll call the meeting to an end. Give one, la one last chance for one last question. Oops. Something about a lot of hard work. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess someone asked if this will help, if this will be brought into production, and I think. You've already answered that, Arlita. Yeah, yeah, we can't comment on, on Intel's product roadmaps at all. Uh, okay. Alesh? Yeah? Could, could I ask a question uh, where people are from here? Uh, sure. Uh, we have a little poll here. Uh, so just to see how many are local versus elsewhere. <laughs> I did see the results. I don't see the poll, but maybe nobody asked me. 
Yeah, I don't see I, the button to vote. I don't see. I, the I think hosts don't maybe get Maybe because vote. you're a co-host, you don't oh, get to oh, see. Right. The, uh, well, that's plus four people for Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Silicon Valley for the win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't see any more questions. So if there's nothing thank else, um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for uh, the exciting presentation. And if you do more, do more work, you can come again sometime. Thank sure. you all. Well, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank yeah. you.